Hi everyone, this is Rebecca at Close.io bringing you our interview series featuring women in sales where we find out how they grow and thrive both personally and professionally. In this episode, I'm speaking with Katherine Stewart. Katherine is the Chief Business Officer at Automatic, the company behind WordPress.com, where she manages M&A, business development, business operations, and strategic projects to grow the company's revenue. Katherine was previously at Facebook, where she helped launch the ad tech business unit and led the long-range planning process. At Random House, she helped the company transition from selling physical books to digital books. At McKinsey, Katherine was a strategy consultant in New York City. She received a Master of Philosophy from the University of Cambridge and a BA from Yale University, where she graduated summa cum laude and was the recipient of the Heligendorf Fellowship. She currently lives in San Francisco, California, and serves as an advisor to several startups in the technology and media sectors. Thank you, Catherine, for being here today. It's my pleasure. It's great to Could meet you. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to meet you as well. Can you tell us a little bit more about Automatic? Many of us know you, uh, know the company as the makers of WordPress, but there's a whole lot more going on as well. So tell us about yeah, that. Absolutely. So WordPress is open source software. Um, you can download it for free. It's protected by general public license. Um, but like many other open source projects, there's a company around it that shepherds the overall um, development of the product and also monetizes in the space around it so that we can keep investing in WordPress and that company is automatic. So we're all about WordPress. Um, we offer um, additional functionality. We offer support. Um, we offer a simpler, more streamlined user experience as well as a um, more completely fully functional experience for um, what we call our VIP customers, which include um, Facebook for um, all of their um, non-owned and operated hosting and um, People Magazine, the White House, and TechCrunch, VentureBeat, a number of other um, companies, mostly in the media and the government spaces. So we're both for individual um, individuals and developers who want to just build their own site online. They, you could be a small business owner or a blogger or these larger companies that want a, a full solution for their, their content. Um, we run about... Um, I guess we're at about 32% of the web in terms of, um, if you look at the top 10 million websites as defined by traffic, about 32% are running on WordPress. So we have a pretty good uh, market footprint and my role is our monetization. Absolutely. I mean, the company is iconic in a sense and everybody in the tech world, including Close.io, we love Automatic. So thank you again for being here. You're also known as the business wrangler at Automatic. So what does being a business wrangler entail and how's, how does one go about being a master business wrangler? Absolutely. So at Automatic, we choose our own titles. There are a number of things that we do differently, and this is one of them. Mm -hmm. And so my, my internal title is, uh, is Business Wrangler. And uh, we're, we're founded by Matt Mullenweg, who is a very friendly Texan, and his internal title is Chief Barbecue Taster. So that gives you a sense of um, some of the other titles that we have in the company. Um, my, my role is, as you described, anything that could relate to increasing our monetization across the WordPress properties. Um, and uh, I should say WordPress, um, it includes WordPress.com, a product called Jetpack, which is um, a plugin that um, is very popular for security and for backups. Um, and another, like our domains and registry business um, and other, other areas that are all in the WordPress ecosystem but, but can lead to monetization. Awesome. I am so excited to uh, delve into your journey and, um, you know, for you to shed some light uh, and guidance for somebody who maybe wants to follow in your footsteps. So I would love it if you could walk us through the career decisions that led you to where you are today. What were you looking for with each role and what would you say you took away from one experience and brought into the next one? Sure. That's a great question. I started off um, as an English major, so I knew I loved publishing and I loved books. I'm the daughter of a librarian. Um, oh, so, <laughs> yes. Very cool. And so my, my first attempt in the working world was applying to publishing companies, traditional publishing companies. So my very first job offer was from, um, was after grad school, was from the Oxford University Press. And 
for better or for worse, that, uh, that job offer, while it was their sort of standard entry level offer at the time, was um, significantly less than $20,000 a year, um, slightly more than $10,000. And so I realized that living in New York, I'd already committed to my apartment, was going to be challenging on that income. And so I reached out to my parents and I said, hey, how would you feel about funding my lifestyle for a few years? This is a really great company and a great job. And my parents said, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. Uh, so I decided I needed to, to investigate other options. So I went to work for McKinsey, which is a consulting company uh, in New York as well. And I figured, all right, well, I'll just come back to publishing later. Um, and maybe they'll match my McKinsey salary. Who knows? But um, this, this is not over. I'll try again. So I went to work for McKinsey two years, got a lot of experience on the um, revenue optimization side, which has become my now area of core expertise ever since. So I worked on um, with a number of companies how to, how to increase uh, their revenue and profitability and then came back to publishing two years later <laughs> and, I, um, and I worked for Penguin Random House. It was just Random House at the time. They hadn't yet acquired Penguin. And I, uh, I worked on the, the business side. And it was a particularly good time to be there because um, at the time, when I joined, the number of, let's just say, well, percentage is probably better. The percentage of units or books, so the percentage of units sold that were in the digital form were less than 0.01%. But anybody could see that there was going to be a shift to, to the digital world. And that even though the Kindle hadn't launched yet at that time, the Sony Reader had, and it was pretty clear that this was going to be an interesting space. And I figured, you know, I always I wanted to work in publishing anyway, but this could be this could be even better. This could be more interesting, not just working on books, but working on books during a, a potential sea change. So um, I got this close. There was no digital division at the time I joined, um, but I ended up uh, talking to the two people at the company who were thinking about digital, and um, eventually we ended up um, really focusing on that. By the time I left, digital had gone from 0.01 percent of units sold to 20 percent for the industry at large. So there was a lot of change that was going on to navigate, figuring out how to stay profitable in the face of um, declining print runs, which increases your per unit costs, um, figuring out how to partner with Amazon and Apple was just getting into the space at the time, and uh, whether or not to partner with Apple, we decided not to, so we were the only company that was not implicated in the price fixing scandal. Um, okay. Didn't have to pay any, any penalties or fines for that. But yeah, we were the, we were the only major publisher that, that chose to stay out of that particular fray. Um, it was a very interesting time with a lot of change and a lot of um, excitement and a lot of eyes on the publishing industry to see what would happen. So that was a very exciting ride. And then I don't want to take too long, but from there I ended up uh, working at Facebook, moved out to California, continuing publishing, but more, um, more staunchly on the technology side of it. Mm -hmm. And after about three years at Facebook, where I originally joined to do, you know, <laughs> do revenue and strategic planning. Um, so my original mandate was to increase the amount of revenue that, um, that um, Facebook was making, mm -hmm. uh, which is a pretty, pretty broad mandate. It was originally intended to be just limited to the, to the small business side, but it ended up, um, it ended up encompassing the direct and the larger account sales as well. And then I ended up working on the long range plan, which was looking at how we could forecast our sales into, um, into the future and what could really move the needle. So when you're thinking about the, the big bets, the things that couldn't just give you 20% or 10% of organic growth a year by increasing views and time spent, if you're really thinking about what can fundamentally drive an additional $1 billion of revenue in the next year, which was a big number for us back then. Um, what would those be? And so I ended up um, eventually um, working on Instagram ads and video ads, and then actually changing over to the product side to work on um, the ad tech business unit. Worked on that for a year. And then that was about the time when Matt Mullenweg, um, my current boss and the founder of WordPress, reached out and asked me if I'd ever considered automatic. I had not. We talked about it for about uh, six months. It was a good long conversation. <laughs> and uh, then I eventually joined in my current role. 
What an amazing story. Uh, have you seen the movie Arrival with Amy, yes. Amy Adams in it? So I was watching this uh, YouTube channel that I love called S Screen Prism. They were doing a tropes and film analysis with Arrival. And one of the things that they mentioned was how um, Arrival explores how we often think about events uh, in our lives and time in a linear fashion and how uh, a lot of the times uh, events or twists and turns in our life, especially in our career, aren't really explained and they don't really come full circle until later on. And I think yes. it's so interesting that, you know, you started off wanting to go into the publishing book world. Parents were like, no. So you're like, okay, well, let me do something else in the meantime. And then uh, working at Random House, I mean, how lucky and blessed were you to have been there at such a pivotal time it just in, in terms of the shift in in our world and how we consume media i mean what an amazing time for you to be there you know at that time i mean isn't isn't life just amazing in terms of how time works <laughs> it is yeah and it, it's helpful to watch the trends as well and know what makes you passionate and what makes you excited mm -hmm. and to try to follow that and you... i would have gone into publishing earlier if that had been financially feasible for me but you know, having, having just paid for a significant chunk of college, it, I didn't really have the savings to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, the off-trodden on fa phrase goes, everything happens for a reason, right? And yeah. I and by the way, have... great choice of book. Um, I love Ted Chiang's stories. Yes. And they're very interesting, thought-provoking um, yes. thought pieces, really. And some of them are free online if any of the listeners want to just download one and, and read through. Awesome. Great tip. I wanted to ask you about uh, your transition to, to tech and if that yep. was something that, you know, you had thought of on the outset or, for, or if it was maybe just you witnessing and managing the shift from physical to digital and really just taking in how, how significant and interesting that world could be and, and what kind of made you want to dive in. Yeah. Um, going back to your you're mentioning of fate. Uh, I was a frequent flyer when I was at McKinsey. You tend to travel a lot for work at that company. Right. And as a Christmas gift, just from the airline, from American Airlines, um, I got a Sony e-reader in the mail one year. And it was probably one of the best Christmas gifts I got that year, even though it was from an airline. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, it was just such a perfect fit. And I was, I was reading, I was using it and reading it. And it was a pretty buggy product at the time. But I was thinking, this is it. This is, this is what's going to happen. I can't wait another two years mm. before I get back into publishing. Now's the, now's the time. So then it was either Amazon or Random House because Random House was the biggest and most well poised to take advantage of a transition and to weather it well on the publisher side. And Amazon seemed to be the, the most interesting from the technology side. And I wanted to stay in New York at the time. So that made my decision very clear. And that's how I ended up at Random House. Now, of course, because Random House wasn't focused on the transition, they had massive operations and, and other ways of making, making money, um, mostly through a lot of people think of the editorial function, but also the printing and the distribution and the relationship with retailers. Um, that's a very core part of what the value is that a, a publisher adds. Marketing as well, but the publishing and the the actual printing and the paper and the distribution are really significant. And so I spent a lot of time on that in my first year, but I really wanted to be working on digital. So I ended up doing um, what some people, I guess at Google has referred to as 20% projects, where mm -hmm. I found that at McKinsey, I was used to working up to 80 hours a week. And at Random House, people tended to go home at five or 6 p.m. And since I'd already become willing and used to working longer hours, I had a lot of time on my hands. And I used some of that time to go out with friends and to start working out again and just have a healthy life. But I was perfectly happy to spend a couple extra hours a day working on, working on digital books. And so I started working with a couple people at the company who were interested. Um, one of them is Nihar Malavia, now the uh, COO. And uh, he basically became a mentor to me. I would do extra work for him and he would, he would teach me the ropes. And that became a very important, and um, that ultimately was, was sort of the door that opened that allowed me to start working more on what I was really passionate about and to learn from, from one of the best. Wow, what a, what a beautifully, beautiful story and, and so well told. I, you know, you wouldn't really 
know and be able to tell from the outset just looking at your resume or looking at you know your series of roles because there are all these little um, tidbits and nuances to each of our own individual stories that you know I hopefully you know do a you know do justice to through the series um, that I think should be honored and, and should be told more often so that we can talk about how you know we strategize and how we plan like there's that side of you that obviously is so good at that because that's your job but then there's also the universe and there's fate and there's you know following your heart and and just following how the world changes i i think that's that's beautiful and awe-inspiring um so switching gears right now to to your uh to your role i understand that a uh, fair bit of uh, those conversations you, you might find yourself in, in in a negotiation conversation or two what would you say your negotiation style is and um, what type of approach or what principles do you do you find yourself falling back on um, and leaning into when it comes to creating a win-win yeah gosh I love negotiation <laughs> thank you for asking <laughs> I thought you might <laughs> Uh, I think it's extremely important to get to know the company and the people that you're working with and to get a sense of also really understand what your goals are. A lot of people focus on short-term revenue, but in some industries, the players will be the same in two or three years. And so a longer-term relationship may be worth investing in. In some cases, you're talking about VC-backed startups that may not be around in six months. That's, that may be different. And in fact, the risk profile might be different. Um, the incentives, both from a, the business model and from the individual of the person that you're speaking with, I think is the most important place to start. Perhaps it, it's at least as, as important as understanding your own objectives. And of course, that's hardly something, it's hardly ever something people need to be told. <laughs> Most people do a very good job of understanding their own objectives before they walk into that room. But thinking also about it as a, as a, as a matrix, the complicated matrix that it is. So it's not just about money. It's really just about money. There's, um, there's the money, there's the reputation, there's the, um, there's the longer term doors that this could open. There's the strategic advantage. There's what it does for your users if you structure it one way versus another. There, it, there's, there's so much there to think about and prioritizing what's most important to you and then really listening and understanding when the other party is speaking to understand what's most important to them. We often, it's a common bias that we often assume that what's important to us will be important to the other party. And that's often not the case. And when it's not the case, that's a, it's a beautiful opportunity for us to both get what we want. Um, that does take some listening. And often people's motivations are not something that they will spell out clearly. Um, however, if you do ask a lot of questions and, and listen and come into that conversation with an understanding of the other's business, that can help enormously. So for example, I don't do any negotiation that is significant and matters from a monetary perspective until we've built a model of their business so that we understand what the likely financial drivers are. Interesting. Like, I have to say that's just a, that's just a place where I start mm. long before even going into the conversation. Right. So, so you're kind of using an analytical approach, just looking at them as a business case, almost a, detaching yourself from the negotiation side and just looking at, you know, what is going on here from their perspective in their shoes. Yeah, there are two reasons. First, I want to understand them. And if I don't understand how their business works, where the fees are, whether they make more money from international or domestic, um, if I haven't taken the time to get to know their business, I may not understand what's important to them. So that often helps level set and helps me understand what kinds of questions I need to ask, either them or another player in the space so I can understand the space better and what's industry standard, um, whatever it might be. So I'd say the first is for understanding. And the second is for understanding ourselves because sometimes it's not easy, especially with a very complex negotiation with many levers, to know whether you're better off, say, adding an extra tier of a revenue share or whether you're better off increasing what that revenue share is for say the second or the third tier. Um, for example, at Random House, which was before I started negotiations myself, but I would help others prepare for them, um, I'd often model out the different 
revenue categories that the um, vendor or the partner or the retailer, whatever it might be, um, would be making. So I could have a sense of, um, hey, this is our historical volume and this is their historical volume. If nothing changed next year over last year, how much money would we make if we changed these levers or if we changed these other levers? And then that can give me a better sense of how much things are really worth to me from a monetary perspective. So that helps level it when you're talking about the money. But I'd say talking about the money, while it always happens and is an important part of it, is also just, just one part of it. There's, there's so much more to a negotiation than just the money. Whether, for example, if you're buying a company, understanding what the founders want their legacy to be, their role within that company to be, what they want that company to stand for after acquisition. What is it that they care about? This is something they've created and they've invested blood, sweat, and tears into making. It's, it's not going to just be about who's going to be paying them the greatest sum of money. They want to make sure that their company vision lives on. And so understanding that vision, really understanding it, um, and then making sure that there's alignment, because that's in both of our interests, and then understanding what we can commit to to make sure that their vision lives on is something that um, I think is extremely important if you're thinking about companies to buy and um, can allow you to win deals that you might not be able to offer the most amount of money for. It sounds like it also takes off a fair bit of pressure when you think of it that way. Well, it can also lead to happier outcomes, better integrations. It's said that up to 60% of M&A deals fail, just even on the most basic metric of were they worth more money after than they were worth before. <laughs> Is the combined entity um, of more financial value or less. And many, many acquisitions fail to achieve even that basic um, aim. And so knowing in advance that acquisitions are difficult to integrate, I think, is something that can help you as well decide when, when it makes sense to pull the trigger and when not to, and the kinds of questions to ask. Because getting a good deal now, right now when you're closing the deal, is important. But two years from now, which is what really matters, and that's really what my job and my responsibility is about, it's setting up automatic for long-term success. Um, I want to be very thoughtful about how that's going to look. And so it's about being financially responsible in the moment, but also making sure that I'm thinking ahead for the future. And for example, maybe that means paying a little bit more to the founders or the key, um, the, the key people the key employees of the company to make sure that they are set up for success. So it might be a little bit more for, for us today, but actually that's in all of our interests because I want them to succeed and stay at automatic and to be happy and, and productive. So I think the world of incentives, while it's certainly in the business side, it does come down and circle around money. It's, it's about so much more than that. That was excellent. I feel like that was, a, that was an MBA on M&A and strategic alignment all there. <laughs> and Catherine, I, I know that you uh, will find yourself uh, wrangling businesses and deals, but you also might find yourself uh, wrangling people, teams, um, values, and motivations. So we want to know how people are organized across departments and across the many products uh, built and managed by automaticians. Um, I, I understand that there are some syndicates and also naming conventions that go along with different countries and different projects. They're super cute and endearing. And, and I wonder if how those play and if they play into creating cohesion and team closeness across these, these different contexts. Yeah, that's a constant challenge. If I had a silver bullet, I would tell you. <laughs> but we are one of the largest fully distributed companies in the world. Um, there are some other big ones out there, but we've got 815 people spread across, um, I think over 50 countries, something mm -hmm. like that. That's a lot of people. <laughs> it's, well, the people I'm sure about, the number of countries is always changing. Um, and both are, are high numbers. And, and that's a lot to wrangle. And that's one reason why I like, I like Matt's, Matt's term wrangler. That really, that really came from our, our CEO and fearless founder. But it, it sort of accurately describes 
the situation, um, you've got not only a lot of people and a lot of teams, but you've got a lot of time zones, and that can that can prove a challenge. So um, there are some nuts and bolts that I like to ensure for some team cohesion. Mm -hmm. For example, if you have a team that's split between Asia, um, the United States, and Europe, you will not be able to get everybody on the phone at the same time <laughs> without one person suffering. And depending on whether it's the summertime or the wintertime, it usually ends up being the same. You could shift it so that's Europe suffering or that's, uh, you, you can shift the suffering, but there's gonna be suffering. And being thoughtful about that when you're putting teams together and it's just an extra layer that, that one logistically needs to be planning for um, when you're thinking about who's working with who. Mm -hmm. another, um, another thing that we do is we travel. So we travel, each team travels about once or twice a year. And then additionally, we have an all company get together uh, where everybody, it's actually in about three weeks time, everybody gets together in one central location. And we're starting to get almost too big for that. So we're going to have to rethink that too. But for now, we're, we're, still, we're still doing it. Although we're probably going to splinter as we continue to grow into different divisions. Mm -hmm. And I, um, since I'm on the executive team, I travel a lot because I not only travel for my teams, but for other teams I work with. So for example, I, um, I'll travel to spend time with the, the design team or I'll travel to spend time with um, the other executives on the team so we can come together and, and talk about our future direction. And I'll also travel to see a partner every now and then or to do a negotiation or to visit a company that we might buy. And while most of my travel is internal, let's say over 80% of my travel is internal, um, I'm still traveling over 50% of the time. And so we're also trying to think about how to scale that. But for now, I'd say there's, there's, there's still no substitute for in-person FaceTime for certain topics. Mm -hmm. And I think having the team get together at least once a year allows for those sort of social bonds and the trust to form. And whenever you're talking about something emotional, mm -hmm. where there are a lot of different stakeholders involved in the success of a decision's outcome, and they may have different perspectives and different incentives, then I feel that it, 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 we still haven't yet hit on the way to, to do that without having everyone in one central location. So what we'll do is just look at the attendees, let's just say there are 13 attendees, and we'll look at the 13 cities they're flying in from and we'll triangulate to find a place that's centrally located, we'll rent a office space, and then we will work there often for three to five days together to hash out a plan and that's that's how we make it work um from a larger like from that's how we make it work in like the tactical day-to-day -day. but from the sort of philosophical how do we make sure mm -hmm. that we all feel like automaticians and we all mm -hmm. understand the culture and we bring it to work with us every day um as you mentioned we've got some cute names like autotoke for um Canada. our canadian <laughs> subsidiary and we've got aut a-U-T-O apostrophe Matic for our Irish subsidiary. <laughs> subsidiary. So we've got some very cute names. That is actually all coming from Paul Siminski, our general counsel. Mm -hmm. um, he's a delightful guy. And he's a lawyer with um, not only um, highly qualified lawyer chops, but also a sense of humor. And creativity. And a lot of creativity. So um, mm -hmm. he does those names. And we all try to be thoughtful about how we approach conversations. We use Slack a lot. So, you know, we, we use the right, we use fun emoticons. We build our own emoticons. When pages are slow to load, um, we've, you know, somebody will, will put in um, like beep, beep, boop or something like, we're still loading your page. It's taking a little time. Bear with mm -hmm. us. So little, little cute, um, cute nods to our culture as, you know, starting in, starting in the, you know, the home office of a, of a Texan who uh, was, was very young at the time and, and very passionate about building something that would connect the world through democratized publishing, through free access to, uh, to software that would allow them to express themselves. So we, we always come back to that. And, and then lastly, when it comes to how one can drive cultural change, slow anywhere, but it's even slower when you're distributed because you're not seeing everybody all the time. And you, you sort of need to make sure that you don't forget to have that continual constant. 
contact. And so what I like to do is office hours on a regular basis, an open door policy so that anybody who wants to within the company can ping me anytime over Slack. They can set up a one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not sure I've ever said no to a one-on-one -on -one request. Sometimes it can take me um, a week or two <laughs> before there's time, but I don't think I've ever said no. Um, at our grand meetup every year when the whole company comes together, I do office hours. I do, I do regular AMAs and town halls. AMAs are ask me anything. Mm -hmm. And I will, um, I will also, whenever there's something that's really important to get through to everyone, we'll try to think about, it's almost like internal marketing, but how can we make sure that this idea sticks? Mm -hmm. So for example, we're all about freedom of publishing, which is, I mean, our motto is democratize publishing. Mm -hmm. That comes from a world that was really all about blogging. And as we move into the SMB space and make sure that we're servicing, um, the small businesses who use our platforms, the larger businesses who are using our CMS, we, we need to make sure that we're keeping their, their, their needs in mind as well. And, um, and so I started talking about, um, our, our head of design came up with the term freedom. And then I said, okay, well, how about this? Freedom to publish and then also freedom of livelihood. So it's basically freedom of speech on one hand, mm -hmm. democratized publishing, and then freedom of helping people realize their dreams and make their businesses viable using our software and our technology. And that freedom of livelihood seems to have stuck a bit. And I'm thrilled because now it means that teams who are having meetups in you know, Detroit or Barcelona or wherever it may be um, are still keeping the businesses in mind. And that sounds fairly intuitive right now but three years ago two years ago um that was not necessarily the case and so yes having having like a real plan for how that communications how the communications can um can start be consistent be reiterated and um and and be passed along throughout this very distributed large company um large for us <laughs> we're nothing compared to many companies out there but that that thoughtfulness i think is is really important to allow us to maintain that cultural identity and also alignment of strategy i i it just hit me and occurred to me that i and i meant and i mentioned this earlier but your your story has come even more for full circle with the theme of publishing because um, what Automatic is, is thereby doing is that you're giving people um, a voice and a canvas to publish their words, their ideas, and their stories. Um, and, uh, and, and, your, and your company's team retreats are actually very notorious to us at Close.io because at every team retreat, we start joking about how, you know, oh no, look at us, we're 30 people. And at the next retreat, we might have, you know, 35 more people. And you know, what restaurant is going to take a reservation for 35 people? I wonder what Automatic does. I wonder how it must be for them. And we start laughing. We always have a chuckle whenever we bring you guys up. So thank you for leading by example there. Um, <laughs> now, I wonder what are some of the levers and tools that you use for employee development? So, so in that livelihood theme, in that term. Um, does it come from what, you know, we here at Close.io sometimes call extracurriculars, for instance, for me, for Rebecca, you know, she's doing the Close.io Women in Sales series. Is it something sort of external or is it something more internal around the way that you have your management systems and your communication set up, um, maybe some mentorship programs? Yeah. So we do have an internal um, mentor mentee system where everyone who joins the company is assigned um, semi randomly to uh, a mentor. And I would say that that's helpful, but far more valuable is the, um, are the mentorship relationships that develop organically. Mm. Because you may not have much in common with your mentor, the one who's assigned to you. You may do very different jobs, and sometimes that's perfect. You can learn about what each other does and that can expand your your understanding of the company and the business but i think there's no substitute for taking the initiative and finding your own mentors from the people around you who do things well so i like to think of almost an identification of like okay what am i not doing as well right now mm -hmm. that i'm seeing somebody else do really well it could be anybody it could be more senior it could be more junior it could be a peer um, and how can I put myself in situations where I can watch what that person is doing? 
Um, for example, Paul, our general counsel, who I've mentioned before, is a great is a, he's a great writer. So great lawyer, great writer. And occasionally I've saved some of his emails. I thought, wow, that was a really well done email. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put that in a folder so I can go back and see the way he, he did that. Mm -hmm. um, he's got a great tone, as you can tell, automatic, automatic. Um, he does a great job of bringing levity to sometimes difficult um, topics. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I've watched him do well. And I thought, huh, how can I, how can I think about doing that more in my own writing? And I think I, I try to encourage people to do that throughout, to see areas of, ex, of just excellence and to try to develop relationships with those, those people so they can learn from them and to be fairly proactive about that. Um, just the way I've never said no to a one-on-one, -on -one, um, I don't think many people have said no to a request for mentorship that came from a place of you know, admiration. <laughs> so um, I do encourage people to, to reach out to, to folks they see doing things well. Um, in terms of our performance development, um, I like to be, as we get bigger, increasingly more structured as to what we expect from different roles. That doesn't sound like much fun, <laughs> but I think it's important because it creates a fairer playing field. So you can be very clear about what the expectations are and there are no surprises and you can evaluate people similarly. And I think that's also important for inclusivity to make sure that we're not bringing some implicit bias into our evaluations and our promotions. I think the more well-defined we can be about what our expectations and our milestones and our metrics are for different roles, the more fairly we can evaluate different people in terms of how well they're performing at those roles. And the more quantitative we can be as well, the better, because that way it's not just about a popularity contest, it's really about who, who's, who's getting things done. And while getting along with your colleagues is important, I don't think it should be the driver of who gets promoted and, and who doesn't, because that is rather multifaceted. So I tend to be quite thoughtful about um, how we're benchmarking folks and, and making sure that's as fair as possible. Uh, we are a little bit more flat and less hierarchical than many companies. Right. So there are a number of ways that we do things differently. Mm -hmm. And when we like to say, well, just because you're a team lead doesn't mean that's a promotion. And in, as you would expect, somebody who is brought into a team lead position is usually somebody who is doing well at their current job and who we believe would be well suited to being the team lead. But that said, if they feel that being a team lead is not a fit, it's not considered a demotion at all if they go back to being an individual contributor. So from that perspective, we, um, we do make sure that Automatic is a place that works for all folks and that it's not necessarily this up or out, you must, you must move in this direction in this particular defined career path. We try to be much more flexible and case by case about what roles are fits for what kinds of people. Mm -hmm. Success isn't always linear. Sometimes it comes full circle. Thank you for everything today, Catherine. Uh, you can find Catherine and learn a bit more about her on her website. It's a web WordPress website, of course, at KatherineTaylorStewart.com. Catherine, where can people reach out to you and connect with you? And, um, you know, let us know, let me know if there's anything that I haven't asked or brought up already that you'd like to leave our audience with. Well, thank you. It's been an honor being on your show. And in terms of reaching out to me, there is a contact form on that WordPress website <laughs> that people can use. Um, you can also find me on, on LinkedIn. Um, you can follow me on Facebook. Uh, so those are all different, different methods, depending on whether you want photos of, of food and travel or <laughs> if you want more professional updates. In any case, um, no, it's a pleasure getting to be on the show. And I've listened to your podcasts in the past and really enjoyed them. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you for being on the Closea Women in Sales series. Thank you. Did you enjoy this episode? I'd love to hear your thoughts and suggestions. If you have questions that you'd like our guests to answer, or if you know of a woman in sales that we should feature, email me, Rebecca at close.io. That's with one B and two C's. And if you enjoyed this episode, got value out of it, got inspired, share it with a friend. There's a link in the description where you can also find show notes and you can follow this series by subscribing to Close.io's YouTube channel, iTunes, SoundCloud, and various other podcast apps that you might already use. See you guys on the next one.